All right, so as I mentioned in the announcements, I want to be focusing here uh, this morning's sermons on 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 on that latter portion of the scripture it starts in verse number 14. And really what this is, you know, this is the second epistle to the church at Thessalonica. It's, a, it's an epistle that's supposed to be read for the entire church. And this is the last chapter, and this is how he's closing it unto the church. And he's basically giving them a list. And these are 12 things that I believe that every Christian should do. So there's, there's this whole list, and, and a lot of them are real short. There's just like two words, three words, but there's a lot of content here. Now, if I wanted to, I could probably create a sermon out of every single one of these points individually. But we're going to go through them all and just kind of compact them together and just, just, just briefly go into each one of these things, these 12 things that he lists off here that we ought to be doing. And again, this was, a, this was a general epistle that was written to the church at Thessalonica, and it's also supposed to be read for everybody. Obviously, it's part of God's Word. It's not just for that church. It's for all churches. Okay, This is for everybody. This is something that we need to be making sure that we're, that we're doing. Let's start off looking here at verse number 14. We're going we're gonna to go through each of these individually. He says, Now we exhort you. Right, so it's an exhortation. He's, he's trying to encourage them to listen and to do these things. The first thing he says, he says, we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Very first admonition, he says, you need to be warning those people. Who are people who are unruly? Well, someone who doesn't want to be ruled over, right? If you're unruly, you're not, you're not accepting the, the rule that's, that's coming over. You're, you're, you're rebelling against authority. Now, in this case, he's talking about rebelling against you know, God's authority. People who are unruly, people who are, who are sinning and just completely disobeying God's word and just seem to have no care for it. Right? People, those who are un, unruly. Well, they need to be warned. What do they need to be warned of? Well, if they're brothers in Christ, if they're brothers and sisters in Christ, and you see you know, someone's coming to church and they're, just, they're being unruly, they're, 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 they're living their life in a way that just seems to not really care about God you know, setting forth his laws and his commandments, we need to warn them. You know, it's not, it's not a, and, and people can sometimes take this the right way, and you ought to be careful the way that you approach a brother or sister in Christ on, on issues that they may be having, because look, we know we're all sinners. None of us is perfect. You know, it's not, it's not doing it to the point to like bring them down and to lift yourself up and make yourself feel better because they're bad. That's not the point at all, but you do need to give, you know, in, in many cases, you need to give a warning and say, look, you know, you're saved. God's going to treat you as a son. It would be like, you know, it's like, it's like my, my daughters, if one of them were to, you know, if one of them's acting up and being real unruly and doing things that they know they shouldn't be doing, one of their sisters coming up to them and saying, you know, if you keep doing that, dad's going to spank your butt. Right? Just giving them that fear. Hey, Maybe you didn't really think about this because you're too busy being unruly, but if you keep it up, dad's going to be angry and he's going to spank your butt. That's the type of warning that we need to give to people. Like, obviously, in, in not those words, but <laughs> just saying, look, brother, you know, this thing that you're doing is it's not good. You know, the Bible says that we should be doing this and, and you know, it's only going to bring trouble in your own life to continue down this path of, of being unruly. So that's something that we are exhorting. It's for the church. This is for the church. Okay, this isn't just for the, this isn't to the pastor. This is, he says, um, now we exhort you, brethren. It's, a, it's a Paul's epistle to the whole church. And he wants it to be read to, to everybody, not just for the leadership. Warn them that are unruly. It's, it's giving a warning. It's not saying, you know, it's not being mean and, and just overly critical, but you're giving them a warning. Say, hey, look, it's not a warning that you're going to do anything about it. It's a warning that God's going to do something about it. Right? Now, depending on the sin, obviously, if there's, if there's a very, very serious sin, you know, the Bible talks about you know, them that are called a brother, if any be a, a fornicator or a drunkard or an extortioner, you know, with such a one so know not to eat, and that they need to be kicked out of the church. So certain sins that could get so bad where, where a brother or sister in Christ that they just need to be, they need to be kicked out of church. But, um, you know, for other sins, when people are just, you know, and you look at that word unruly. Right? It's, it's not just you made a mistake and you sinned. That's not being unruly. It's not, it's not something where, you know, because we, we, I sin all the time. You know, we, we, make, we make mistakes. But there's a difference between someone, you know, someone who's being unruly has more to do 
It has a lot to do with their attitude about, about sin. Not just they screwed up. It's, it's an attitude of being unruly and, and not caring what God's law says. Those are the people we have to, we have to warn. And we do that out soul winning too. You know, there's people that, that they don't want to hear the gospel, they don't care, they don't want to think about it, say, well, look, we need to warn you that there is a punishment for not believing in Christ. It's, you know, it's, it's hell. You're going to suffer for eternity in hell. It's a warning. It's not because we hate them and want them to feel bad about themselves. Or, you know, look, no, we just need to warn them. I mean, the Bible says, um, and some have compassion making a, dis a difference and others save with fear, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. He says that, that, you know, some people need to be saved by fear, fear of hell, fear of the, you know, the warning that you give them and say, hey, there's consequences for our actions. So that's the first one. Warn them they're unruly. Number two, comfort the feeble-minded. Now, keep your finger here. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah 35. We're going to be, we're going to be spending the whole, the whole morning going through his 1 Thessalonians 5, so make sure you've got a bookmark there. Turn to Isaiah 35. The Bible says to comfort the feeble-minded. Now, the word feeble means, just literally means weak. So people who are weak-minded. This may be someone, or this is someone who's not necessarily very strong in their faith. Right? Or it's someone who's just not very intelligent either. You know, people who are feeble-minded, you may not, you know, there's, there's some people that don't have much of an education. They're just not very smart. And people who haven't been reading their Bible and they don't know much, much scripture, you know, we, don't, we shouldn't be looking at those people with disdain, with anger, with, you know, oh man, you're so stupid. The Bible says comfort the feeble-minded. Okay, now the world's attitude is going to be a, you know, get smart or, or, you know, tough luck. You know, the, the natural selection type of thing. You know, the only the strong survive type of an attitude. That's not the attitude that we need to be having. The Bible says here to comfort the feeble-minded. And then the next one goes hand in hand with that. It says support the weak. So number two and number three are very similar. The first one's talking about their mind. And the second one's just weak in general. So you're in Isaiah 35. Look at verse number three. The Bible says, Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. So when I see that comforting the feeble-minded, you're comforting them. You're trying to make them feel a little bit better. They're not that strong in their faith. They, 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 they don't have the knowledge. They don't have the wisdom. They're feeble-minded. And he's saying here in Isaiah 35, we, we see a perfect example of this, of strengthening the weak hands by saying, look, you know, those that are fearful, those that are worried about, man, if I take this stand for the Bible, you know, I can't really defend the position. I could see that it's right, but, but, but you know, they, they may not be able to, to, to hold their own in an argument or a debate with somebody and just say, you know, feel like I'm kind of feeble-minded, I'm weak-minded when it comes to being able to, to explain why the Bible is right and, and, and why I believe that the homo should be put to death. And what, you know, like People get all angry and I'm not going to be able to explain it very well. And I'm not good with words. You know, my, my mind's not good for this. Well, we need to comfort the people. You know, you know, support them. Give, them. give them strength. That's what you do when you comfort someone. You're trying to build them up and give them some strength. And what they do here in Isaiah 35, he says, those that have a fearful heart, he says, be strong, fear not. You have nothing to worry about. Just, just stick with it you know, and exhort them comfort because your God's going to come with vengeance. God is looking out for you. You don't have to worry about all these people that are coming after you. You don't have to be afraid of them. Okay, you may not be able to explain things the best way. You may not have all of the knowledge, but you can know this. And you can take comfort in the fact that God will be watching over you and that God will take care of those that are, that are going to do wickedly. And that ultimately, He's going to take vengeance on it so we don't have to worry about it. Comfort the feeble-minded. And then support the weak. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 20. Because here the weak doesn't necessarily have to do with just their mind. There's other things that can make a person weak. You know, someone who's weak, you could be weak physically. And the Bible says support the weak. We need to, you know, again, the world's going to tell you only the strong survive. 
Well, not in God's house. We need to support the weak. We need the strong need to be there to help those that are weak. Weak physically, weak in their health. You know, we need to be there to help each other out. We need to be there to support the weak. Look at verse or Acts 20, verse number 35. Bible reads, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now he ties in supporting the weak with giving. Right? That's what he's, the way that you support the weak, according to him, he says, remember the word, you'll support the weak and remember what Jesus said. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. So in order to support people, sometimes it's going to require you giving, giving of your time, giving of your resources to help other people out and to support them. Support, you're, you're trying to help them out, lift them up. You know, sometimes, you know, someone might, might get really ill and, and not be able to go to work and, hey, they're going to need some support. They're going to need some help. We need to be supporting the weak. Turn, if you would, to Romans 15. It's one chapter over, Romans 15. Again, we're looking at 12 things that every Christian should do. One, we need to warn them that are unruly. We need to comfort the feeble-minded. Three, Number three is supporting the weak. And we're looking at other scripture that supports us. Romans 15, verse number one reads, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. And not to please ourselves. Again, it's a reference to, to, you know, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Hey, if you're strong, you need to be bearing, you know, helping out and carrying that burden, that load that someone who's weak and just, just unable to take care of things and not to worry about just pleasing yourself. Not to say, oh, well, yeah, it's, it's too bad for them. They've got all these problems. I'm going to go out and have some fun. Right? Oh, man, that's, that's too bad. I feel bad for him, but pff, I'm just going to go out and do whatever is pleasing to myself. No. You know, you're strong. You're in a good way. Help that person. Go, when people get sick, and this is why I always want to have it, when people get sick in our church and they have no one else to take care of them, you know, we need to be there to like bring them meals, bring them water, bring them whatever, you know, whatever it is to just, to just to help out. Because when you're weak, you need a little bit of help. And that's fine. That's, you know, that's what we're here for. This is, this is given to us as our job to do as a church. Support the weak. And you, know, you may not be weak now, but all of us go through different periods when we're weak and when we need a little bit of help. And we need to be there to be able to support the weak. Let's move to the, uh, or let's keep reading here because Romans 15, 1, I didn't read the rest of the verses. Uh, it says, we then that are strong, in verse 1, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Christ is the perfect example, of course. What did he do? He supported the weak. He healed the sick. Right? He, he did all these great miracles to help people out. And that was taking up his own personal time that's what he devoted his time doing. Not worried about himself and being comfortable all the time and, and, and doing pleasure. When do you ever see Jesus going on vacation? Never. You don't see him. You don't see it. Like, the only th time you see him doing anything is taking a little bit of rest when he's been dealing with people all day long and he goes up in a mountain to pray. You know, like, like just to get away from the crowds briefly. That's we see getting some normal rest that you just need to have physically as a human being to get some rest for your body to, to, to get, you know, to have that. But other than that, we don't see him just going off into pleasure. Like just, hey, let's go to the theme park today. <laughs> like, like forget, forget those people over there. We're going to, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to go to the theme park and just do this and do that. Jesus didn't do that. And I'm saying he's the perfect example. And again, you know, I don't want to get all, all involved in, you know, whether or not if you take a vacation, I'm not saying that taking a vacation ever is wrong, but we need to be focused about other people. And when other people have needs, you know, don't just worry about your own pleasures. Give unto them. Let's go to the next one here. Uh, so back in 1 Thessalonians 5. Hopefully you kept a, a finger there. We're going to keep going through these verses. Verse 14, now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, 
comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. We need to be patient. You ought not to be someone who's so quickly upset or angered by things that other people do. Having patience. Uh, long suffering is a, is a great word that the Bible uses for, for this, a similar type of an attitude where you can suffer long. When people are doing things wrong and, and you just suffer it, you allow it to happen and just, you don't have to say anything, you say, okay, I'm going I'm to allow these things to happen just as Jesus Christ did. You know, he suffered the shame when they were beating him and they would put the bag over his head and would hit him and say, prophesy unto us, you know, who did it? And they're just ridiculing him and mocking him and spitting in his face and putting that crown of thorns on him and putting, putting the, the, the purple robe on him and bowing down mockingly, to, you know, mocking him as a king. He suffered it to happen. He was very long-suffering. He's long-suffering to us words when, you know, we're sinners. We deserve an eternity of hell, but through his long-suffering, he's allowed us even to live long enough to hear the gospel and get saved. He suffers long even after we get saved. You know, sometimes you get in sin and stuff and, and you know, he's merciful and long-suffering. And we need to, to, to keep the proper attitude in check where, you know, and, and having, you know, having children is a good test of patience. I'll tell you that right now. But, but parents, you know, keep that in mind. God is your heavenly Father. Think about the long suffering He has. Now, it doesn't mean you get away with everything, and that and that everything you do, it's He's so long suffering that He's never going to discipline you. But He is patient. You know, we I, I can only imagine what it must look like to God when we try to even do things that are right. You know, because <laughs> I look at my kids and they, and they you know, Daddy, look, I did this, I did that, and they're like all happy because they think they do something great. And you're like, you know. I, mean, I don't want to say it too much, but <laughs> I don't want my kids to be discouraged. But they, you know, there, there's things that that ultimately they're really not that big of a deal, and they and they think it's such a such a big thing. And I, I often think that you know when when we're doing things, sometimes we're probably thinking, man, I'm doing all this great stuff for God, and God's probably like, yeah, that's cute, you know, like you're trying real hard. But uh, just just the difference between how knowledgeable and and, and all all powerful is, you know, compared to us. Trying to, trying to figure out our way uh, through what we're supposed to be doing here. But, um, you know, he's patient towards us. We need to maintain that patience. You know, there's no reason to just be getting angry with people because they don't do things right. Or maybe, maybe they are weak. Maybe they are feeble-minded. But, um, I, and I believe that there's no coincidence that this being patient towards all men is listed right after supporting the feeble-minded and, and the weak. You know, that, that those are people that oftentimes you can get impatient with. Because, why? Because they're needy, because they need something. And oftentimes, you know, and, and this, is, this is human behavior. Someone needs something. Well, that requires work on my part to go and help that person out. So you get irritated. You get a little angry. Oh, why do they need that? I want to go off and do something fun, but this person needs something now. And having that type of, you know, see that, that type of a bad attitude and say, well, I guess I'll do it, but you're not being very patient. Then they say, oh, you know, can you please get me this? Can you please give me that? And then not being, you know, not just not being patient and loving and caring for that person. I believe these, these things all are tied together and that we ought to have the patience and say, okay, here's somebody. And, and having patience, especially if you've grown in the faith, with people who are, who are more newly saved, who don't know the Bible that well, hey, you need to be patient with those people. They need to learn. You can't expect them just to know everything right off the bat. There needs to be time to grow. I mean, with my, with my newborn son, I need to be patient with him. I can't expect, oh man, why, why do you keep going in these diapers? You know, can't you just use the toilet? You know, it's like, no, 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 no. That, you know, that's growth. Obviously, he's not to that stage yet. And we need to remember that. It's, you know, when, you're, when you're much farther along, they need to grow. And you need to be patient and allow for that growth and to help with that growth. Help them along the way. Support them in their, in their growth process and, and help them continue to grow so they're not just stuck in the baby phase, right? Like if we're talking about a Christian, you know, but having that, the right attitude and the right heart. We need to be patient 
towards all men. Let's keep reading here in First, in first Thessalonians chapter 5. Look at um, verse number 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. So he's not even talking just in the church. He's saying you ought not to be taking vengeance for things that are done wrong to you. Don't, don't render evil for evil. When someone does you wrong, someone does, you know, you don't need to go and get them back. It doesn't matter if it's someone in church or if it's somebody outside of the church. God does not want you exacting vengeance on anybody. We need to have the long-suffering, forgiving type of an attitude and let God deal with making sure all the wrongs get right. Amen. He will take care of, all, he'll balance the scales out. Don't worry about it. God actually doesn't like it when you get involved and when you try to do that stuff. He might have to bring some discipline down on you because that's his job and you're usurp usurping his authority and his role and his responsibility to take care of those things. It's not our job to right every wrong. That's why the Bible says, you know, to, to him they'll take your, your uh, cloak, you know, give him your coat also to say, fine, here, you know, like take it. I don't care. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, to fight and get involved in this in this this struggle over things that don't matter. And you do me wrong, I'm going to turn the other cheek and I'm just going to keep on doing what's right. Cuz God will see that. And it's just like, you know, it would, the children of Israel is a great example when they would get do wrong by God and he'd have to punish them. Well, when they were doing right and they were, you know, seeking the Lord and getting rid of sin and trying to do what's right, when people would oppress them, God would take care of it. God would make sure, like, like there's times where entire armies were just wiped out by God without any humans like doing anything, where they would just, God just made them, you know, all fight each other or whatever, you know, like, like just completely saved and delivered them because they were doing what was right. And that they didn't have to worry, they didn't have to have that fear because when you're doing what's right, hey, God will take care of those things. We don't need to render evil for evil. And now, look, should people be doing evil to you? No, but... That's not your job to make sure it gets righted. Uh, let's keep reading here the same verse. It says, But ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. So he reiterates the rendering evil for evil on any man. He's like, just do that which is good among yourselves and to everybody. You know, just do what's right. Verse 16, rejoice evermore. Now this is interesting because the Bible's given us a command here. These are all, these are all commands on, on how we ought to be living. Right? Supporting the weak, you know, warning the unruly, being patient. Rejoice. God wants you to be happy. God wants you rejoicing. How can we rejoice evermore? Well, first of all, we need not to be bitter about anything in our, like where we're at in our life. And, you know, the cards have been dealt with us and say, oh, well, this person's doing evil unto me. And having that you know, let it, allowing that for you not to rejoice. See, when you leave the, venge the vengeance unto God, and this will tie in from that last point, you can still be happy. Because if you were had to do it yourself, you're not going to be, it's, that's not a joyous thing. And then you're going to have to, feed, you know, try to do it right. You know, like, make sure when you're exacting vengeance, it's not going to be quite right. But when you can just rely on God, you can still be happy. You could trust and be like, hey, you know what? These wicked people that are do causing all kinds of harm and pain unto others, you can still be happy knowing that God sees these things. And He's not just going to let it go and, and, and they'll just all be unpunished. Regardless of what you seem to think, it looks like people might be getting away with things. Hey, you know what? Their end is probably going to be hell. They're not getting away with anything. And that is way worse of a punishment than anything that you could ever do to that person. And you just need to be able to re-rejoice. Say, so you know what? God's going to make sure that everything's right, that everything's good, and that, that He takes care of it all. We can rejoice evermore. But um, also in 1 John, chapter, you don't have to turn there. In 1 John, in chapter 1, verse number 4, the Bible reads, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. So he starts off the, 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 the passage from 1 John saying, Hey, we're writing all these things unto you so that your joy may be full. He said, we want you to be full of joy. And then in the next chapter, verse 1, in chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, my little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. So first he's saying, I want your joy to be full. And then he's saying that you sin not, implying that 
by, by keeping yourself from sinning, you will be, you will have joy. Because when you get involved in sin, your joy is going to be gone. Uh, David, in, in one of the Psalms, David said, you know, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. When David, and this was after David committed that, that horrible sin with Bathsheba and had Uriah the Hittite killed, he was not happy. You know, did he get what he wanted? Yeah, you know what? He got what he wanted. He got a woman and, and got the other man out of the way. Wasn't happy at all. Not at all because he was in sin. Because it was a, it was a horrible thing that he did. It was, and it was a, he had no joy. He didn't have the joy of his own salvation. No joy when you get into sin. You, you know, they, it looks enticing. It looks good. You know, the devil's going to try to make you think, oh yeah, you know, booze, you know, get drunk, alcohol. It looks, it's a great time. Look at all these people are having so much fun. They're laughing. You will not have any joy in getting drunk. You'll have a fool's moment where you might laugh, but the end of that, you will be empty. You will not have joy. You're going to wake up the next day going, oh, what did I say? What did I do? What kind of stupid things did I do? And, and having no joy whatsoever. I made a fool out of myself. That's what's really going to happen. See, Satan doesn't want you to see the full picture. He'll just show you one little snapshot where everything looks great. It's all deceptive. It's an illusion. Sin, any enticement into sin is always an illusion. Committing fornication or adultery, same thing. It's that, it's that momentary, this is going to be great. And it never, never is. Never is. So if we want to be able to rejoice evermore, we need to try to you know, keep ourselves from sin because the sin is going to make you not have joy. God wants you to be happy, which is why he gave us these laws and these rules to follow. Because if you are able to follow the instructions that God has laid out for you, you don't have to worry about being sad and upset. You, you don't have to worry about that being a, a, you know, a problem in your life. You know, people who are depressed and taking all these pills and these drugs because they're depressed and, and they have all these problems, they need to get in the Bible and just start getting right with God. Honestly, I, I mean that. I, I, you know, the, the world might laugh at me and say, oh yeah, you, you know, you're so ignorant. You don't know that the, they have a chemical imbalance. And all that. Look, if they get right with God, I guarantee you they will be much happier. They will not be depressed. When you go out and start serving God and start bringing people to Christ, look, you are not going to be depressed. I don't care who you are. But you have to follow God's plan. You have to do it the right way and follow what His Word says. Look, the Bible is not, you know, it's, it's truth. It's not a lie. These things write we unto you that your joy may be full and that you may take Prozac. No, that your joy may be full. These things, it's written in the Bible. This is how you do it. It's an instruction, man. You don't need drugs to be happy. But we are instructed to rejoice evermore. Now, I know that's real broad saying, yeah, don't sin. Okay, yeah, well, we all sin. I get that. But in order to, to be able to rejoice, we need to work on it. Take it seriously. It's, a, it's another aspect of sin is just your own joy. You lose your own joy. So let's see here. Where are we at? We are on the next verse, number 17. Pray without ceasing. Now, you can read this a few different ways. You know, I, I don't think he's saying like, like you can't even go to sleep because you need to just pray without ever stopping. I think it has a little bit more to do with praying for your needs and not giving up on them. You're not stopping. You know, pray without ceasing. Pray, keep praying for the things that you need and the things you want. And keep asking God and go to God and, and continue to go with Him in prayer. And, um, you know, and, and honestly, we should be praying a lot. You know, there's a lot of part of our time where you are doing things where you can easily pray to God. And, and ask him for things. You could be driving somewhere. You could be standing in line at checkout at the grocery store. You could be, you know, great opportunities to pray because you don't even have to pray out loud. You could just pray in your mind and in your heart to God. 
Now, I'm not going to get all into prayer. I do think there's time for, for praying out loud and to getting on your knees and to, and to humbling yourself and to getting in your closet and praying when no one can hear you. But there's also times where you could just be praying in your head. These things are all valid. But turn, if you would, to Matthew 21. Again, keep your finger in 1 Thessalonians. We're going to look at a few things here about prayer and why we should pray without ceasing, why we should continue to pray. Prayer is so powerful and, and you know, if, if more people understood how open God's ears are and willing to answer prayers, I think more people would be doing it. The problem is, I think some people, they don't see the results that they want immediately. So I'll tell you this, God is not Burger King. It's not just have it your way. God is not your servant to do all of your will and all of your wishes. So remember that too when you pray to God. He's not there just to be at your beck and call and just do everything you tell him to do. He's not your genie, right? He's not that magical creature that's just going to do anything you wish. But he is going to listen to you as his child and take it in consideration when it's, when it's according to his will. Hey, he'll give it to you. Ask him for things that are good and right. He'll give it to you. Look at uh, Matthew 21, verse number 21. Matthew 21, 21, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. He's saying we need to have faith when we pray to God. Know that he's there and will answer our prayers. And that he's capable of it. And he's powerful to do it. And he, he's listening and waiting to answer prayers. for you know Not at our beck and call, but he is there to listen to us. And, he, and we do have these great promises. He's saying, look, if you ask in faith, you could move mountains. That is, that is the power that, that's available. God's power and God's might through your just going to him. And asking him and believing. Believing that he's able to do these things. Turn back, if you would, to chapter 7, Matthew 7. Matthew 7, verse number 7. The Bible says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you? Now look, he just gets done telling us, if you ask, you're going to get it. Look, ask God for things. You know, ask God for the stuff that you need and he'll give it to you. He'll hear you. He'll answer your prayers. Verse number nine says, Or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? He's saying, look, what, what father is there when, you're, when your child comes to you and is hungry and asks you for some bread, you're just going to give him a rock? And be like, here you go, eat, chew on that. That's not going to happen. Verse number 10. Or if you ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? You know, something that's going to kill him? He's going to do something bad to him because he asked for some fish or for some food? He says, if ye then, being evil. He said, you are evil. And you know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And I'm going to tie that in just a second. He's saying, you know, as a father to the child. Now look, is the father just going to give to their children every single thing they ask, no matter what it is, just regardless of, of whether it's good or whether it's bad, and just say, you know, whatever. I mean, if your child asks you for something that's, that's just not good at all for them, as a loving father and caring father, because you're looking out for them, you're not going to give it to them because you know what's better for them than they know. Sometimes there's things that you may ask for in prayer that God doesn't give to you because he knows that's really not what you need. You may think it is sometimes, but that's not what you need. But God can underst does understand what you need and can still help you out with that and give you things that you didn't realize were the actual solution to your problem. And we need to go to him for that. And, he's saying, and, he, and he uses this example of saying, look, if your child asks you for some food because they're hungry, you're going to give it to them because you're their father, because you love them. Well, what happens if they don't ask? Well, they're just going to sit there and be hungry then. 
right? Because, I mean, they're not going to be able to do it themselves. When we have problems, we need to just go to God. And, and when they're legitimate, when, you know, when it's the good thing and the right thing, and we ask God for this stuff, hey, go to Him and ask Him. Don't, if you don't do it, you're not, you know, don't expect to get anything. Go to Him and ask. And it's no, it's no coincidence also that I, I, I read verse 12, and he says, therefore, after he gets done saying, ask and you shall receive, you know, you know what father is there? He, he says all those verses, and then he says, therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. So he's saying, you do what's right. The way that you want people to treat you, you do that, because God will answer your prayers. See, prayers are always, and, and I preach an entire sermon on this, are, are conditional in a sense. Like, the good child is, the, the father's going to hear a lot more that the good child asks for than the one who's just really disobedient and, 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 and is an unruly child. When the unruly child asks me for something nice, I'm going to be like, no. You need to learn just how to, how to be good and obey first, and then I'll start listening to these, to these other requests that you have and be a lot more likely to bless you and give them to, the, to you. Well, God's the same way. If you're just disobeying everything that He's already telling you, and then you go and ask Him for something, He's going to say, no, listen to the things that I told you to do first. And then I'll listen to you. You, know, you listen to me first, and then I'll listen to you. So there's things that we need to understand in our prayer life. You know, If we want our prayers to get answered, that we ought to be doing. But... The Bible says we ought to pray without ceasing and continue to go to God with things and, and rely on Him and trust Him and have faith that He is able to perform the things that He says He is. Let's keep going here. I'm going to hurry up a little bit. Verse 8, or not verse 8, point number 8. Verse uh, Number 7 in our list of 12 was pray without ceasing. Uh, verse 18, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So he's saying explicitly, this is God's will for you. Give thanks for everything. And this has to do with you being joyful as well and being content with the things that you have. The Bible says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Tying in that last portion of praying without ceasing, he says, Everything you do by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. So when we pray to God, we should be thankful for what we have. You know, even though you may have a need, you, you, you give thanks to God for even what you have and what He's given you. You could be in the, in the worst position you've ever been in your life. We still ought to be giving thanks unto God. Thank you, God, for what I do have. Thank you for where I'm at and what you've given me, dear Lord, and sustaining me to this point and having that type of, of thanks. He says, in everything. Not in good times only. In everything. Whether, whether you're being really blessed and, and financially or whatever, you have a lot of good things going for you, your health is great, your family is great, of course give thanks for those things. But also when things aren't going that great, have the, you know, the attitude of Job. Hey, the Lord, the Lord hath given, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank God for, for all He's Thank God that He gave me what He gave me. You know, this is the type of attitude that we ought to have. Hebrews 13.5 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. What you have, God's allowed you to have. Don't be, um, you know, this is, this is something I, I, I teach in my children as well. Look, the food that you get in front of you, you ought to be very thankful for that. It may not be the, the, the tastiest thing. It may not be your favorite food. But you ought to be very, very thankful that you have the food that you have. Because God has blessed us with this food. You know, God has given us this. And, and I don't care if it's not your first choice. You are going to live another day and your body is not going to have to experience hunger because you have this food. We need to keep that, always keep it. And, and you know, that's an easy example of food. But with Everything that we have, no matter where you're at, no matter how little money you make, or no matter how much money you make, no matter what your living arrangement is, and no matter how, how small of a space you have, or no matter what, you know, what physical things you have or don't have, be thankful for what you have because you know what? God's able to take what you do have away. If you are going to be this, this spoiled brat type of an attitude with God, He's going to say, oh, 
so you're not thankful for everything I've already given you? And you're going to complain and be bitter about the things that you don't have and be covetous and looking at other people and wishing you had their life? I've given you these things. Guess what? He can take them back too. Keep that in mind. We need to be humble and, and, and thankful. <laughs> I praise God. You know, we don't have all, you know, I don't want to bring up my life too much because we're, we're, we're doing just fine. You know what? Everybody's answer should be, we're doing great. When it comes to just, just anything in general, praise God for what he's given us. Praise God for our family. Praise God for, for what we're at and, and be thankful for the things that he's given you because, I mean, we all, everyone here that's saved, and I believe everyone here is saved, but, um, Everyone here that's saved, be thankful for your salvation. I mean, that alone is huge. And anything else along the way, I mean, you just be thankful. For, thankful for the job that you have. Be thankful for the, the, everything in your life. We need to, to be in everything, give thanks, as the Bible says here. Point number nine, let's keep moving here. Verse 19, quench not the spirit. So here's another warning, to quench not the spirit. Now, what does that mean? To quench something. So, the Bible uses the word quench oftentimes when you, uh, like, well, you think of commercials, right? Quench your thirst. When you quench your thirst, you're getting rid of your thirst. Right? You're real thirsty. You, you, you got a drink of water. This is going to quench my thirst. It's going to make that feeling go away. It's going to make that thirstiness go away. When you quench a fire, you're putting it out. Right? You have a fire. It's, it's blazing. You, you put it out. You've quenched the fire. It's gone. Well, the Bible is saying that you can quench your spirit. You don't want to see, we have, God, God has given us His Holy Spirit. God has given us the, the Holy Spirit. When we do wrong, you're going to feel a conviction. You should feel that, that hey, what I'm doing isn't right. right. The things that I'm doing, this is wrong. I shouldn't be doing this. But you know what? You can quench that spirit. You can continue to just do over and over again what's wrong and just ignore that, that nagging feeling, that, that, that spirit that's, that's prompting you, saying, this is wrong, don't do this, don't do this, and that, that feeling, you can get to the point where you quench that. I know this firsthand. After I got saved, I was still going out to, to bars and stuff, and I knew that it was wrong. When I, after I knew that it was wrong, I, I still wanted to do it anyways. And you know what? After a while, you can dull the spirit to where... You don't even think about it anymore. It's not coming up. You're quenching. You're putting that spirit out. That is very dangerous to do. Don't do that. We need to be mindful of the, the Holy Spirit of God. This is God trying to communicate with you personally, which is an amazing thing that he gave us anyway, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We already have his word. We know what's right, but he's given us this extra gift of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit don't silence that, that, that feeling, that, that, that spirit from working in you and trying to tell you this is wrong, this is wrong, don't do this. Don't quench that because over time you can quench that. Don't quench that spirit. It's gonna, that's going to be disastrous for you. when you Because you, you continue down those sinful paths. Look, sin when it's finished bringeth forth death. And that's ult the ultimate end of just you know, just because you like your sin, you want to keep doing it and you quench that spirit. Well, the Spirit's the one thing that's, that's helping you to change. It's going to be a lot harder than to get rid of those sins when you've already quenched the Spirit. Don't do that. <laughs> Quench not the Spirit. Verse 19. Verse 20. Despise not prophesyings. I think, again, these two go pretty hand in hand. Prophesyings. It's not, it, you know, when the Bible uses the word prophesy, it's not just talking about future events. Okay, the word prophesy, and you look it up for yourself, do a word study, prophesying, prophesy, it's preaching. Okay, it's preaching God's word. Sometimes they may have to do with a future event, and sometimes they don't. But we see the prophets, you know, the Bible talks a lot about prophets. A lot of times the things that they said aren't future events, but they're still prophesying. They're preaching God's word. They're preaching the truth. And the Bible's saying, don't hate the prophesying, the preaching of God's word. Don't despise that. Just because it may go against something that you're doing, you know, don't get angry at the preaching. 
That's, that's the wrong place to get angry with. And that's because in so doing, you, you could end up quenching your spirit too. Your spirit could be telling you this is right, but then you're just like, no, I don't like this. I don't, I don't, I don't, don't want to do it. And just having a, a stiff neck and a rebellious attitude towards God's word. The Bible's warning us against that. Let's keep moving along here. Here We're almost done. Verse 21. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. So the Bible tells us not to be stupid. You know, when we're, when we're approached with things, especially with teachings and prophesyings, right? Say, so don't despise the prophesyings of God's word, but also prove them. Okay? Prove all things. Prove means test it. Test it out. If I want to prove something, you're, 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 you're determining, is this actually true? You know, back in, uh, in high school, we took a geometry class and we had a lot of proofs that we had to do, right? And it was, it was, it was kind of a fun class. I enjoyed it. I'm kind of a math nerd though. But the proofs that you would do, you would give all these different rules and laws and explaining like why whatever the statement is, is true. And, and you know, I'm really vague now on, on all the things that we did. But, but you have, you're, you're supporting, basically you're giving all the evidence and you're using logic and reasoning and saying, this is why this is true. Because this is true, this is true, this is true, this is true. You put these all together, the, 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 the original statement is true. And you prove it. And in my preaching, when, I, when I'm standing up here and trying to tell you, hey, thus saith the Lord, God says this, the Bible says this, I'm not just speaking out of my own heart, I'm trying to prove it to you. That's why we turn to many different scriptures. And I'll try to explain, like, look, this is what the Bible means when it says, you know, look not thou upon the wine when it's right. It, it, it means don't look at it. <laughs> That's an easy one. But there's a lot of things, because people will take God's word and try to twist it out of context, or they'll, they'll take one verse and they'll just preach an entire sermon and they'll just tell you, oh yeah, God wants you to do this and that and this and, and just give you all kinds of different things and they don't prove it to you. Well, God's putting the responsibility on you to prove all things. Don't rely on me. You know, I try to help you out with that job and show you, look, the scripture says this and this. But even at the end of the day, you have to go home and say, did Pastor Burson take anything out of context? Because we go pretty fast through this stuff. We're, we're flipping back and forth between, between pages. And, you know, people who are real slick can do this and be real convincing with it. But if you're not careful to prove what they're saying, they can get you into false doctrine real quick. By, by, being, by being subtle about it and, and just, just using certain verses that support their argument. And, um, you know, obviously I'm not trying to do that, but it, the responsibility ultimately falls on you to prove those things. And he says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. The, the things that, that are come out that are good, yeah, hold on to that. That's good. Keep that. But the rest of the stuff, you know, don't, don't believe it. Believe what's proved, what's proven. Verse number, that was number 11. So as I said, there's 12 things. So the last thing on the list here is verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. We need to make sure that we are not, not only are we not doing evil, but that we are not even appearing to do evil. And this is something you need to be careful for because it can cause problems with others. It's, it's having a heart of, of not wanting other people to stumble and other people to fall. You can do things. You can say, well, I didn't do anything wrong. Here's a perfect example. Would be someone who maybe you're dating somebody, right? Maybe you have a young man and a young woman and they're dating. And... Maybe they're, you know, like they're old enough where they're out on their own, but the, um, you know, they're seeing each other, not doing anything wrong. They're not, they're not committing fornication, right? They're not, they're not doing things that, that would be, that would be a sin. But they say, oh, well, we live far apart from each other, so why don't you just come and spend the night here? Well, my friends, that's the appearance of evil. When someone, when, the, when someone from the opposite gender comes and stays inside of your house until the morning and then you wake up and then they leave, even if you didn't do anything wrong, you didn't, you didn't commit the act, 
the, the appearance of that, what is anyone else going to think when they see someone come into your house in the evening and then they leave in the morning and it's just a man and a woman in that house and you're dating? That is the appearance of evil. And the Bible says not to do it. And you go, you could, you, it's so easy to try to justify yourself in this matter. You can say, but I didn't do anything wrong. Is this, this is the easiest case to justify what your actions were. You say, I didn't do anything wrong. You did because you just made the appearance of evil. If someone else were to say, look, they know you're a Christian. They know you believe the Bible and that you say, we're not going to fornicate. We're going to wait until we get married and everything else. And someone sees that happen. Your credibility shot because you, it's, it's the total appearance of evil. And that's just, that's just one example. But we need to be careful with all of these things that we do. You know, that we're not, you know, if, if I were to be, and this is one of the reasons, one of the reasons why I don't go driving around with, with someone of the opposite gender. Just, just me, and, me and a person, you know, me and a female going out and doing things. Like, for example, we're looking at new buildings and the, the real estate agent that I'm using is a female. I'm not going out and getting in our car together and going in these empty buildings, you know, and, and I mean, someone could just be like, wow, there's Pastor Burson's and some, some strange woman going together, doing who knows what, you know, who knows what. That's where the rumors start. And honestly, that's the appearance of evil. Now, uh, in addition with abstaining from the appearance of evil, you know, we also need to not make provision for the flesh. We need to be on guard against our own flesh, against these other sins that can happen. You know, for someone, for, the, for the, the, the man and woman that are dating and they come and they stay together, do you know how much that raises the level of temptation to, to actually do, commit a sin? You're, you're, you're lift, raising that up a whole nother level. If you, ne if you had a rule and you never allowed that to happen, it's not going to happen. As soon as you let them in, though, if you say, oh, well, no, it's fine, we're not going to do anything, yeah, you plan on not doing anything, but the situation can easily escalate and, and get to a point to where you know, you've already made provision. You're in your house. No one else is going to know. No one sees anything. <laughs> you know, you have a weak, you, then you have that weak moment, right? And this is what happens with people you know, that are married. They have these weak moments, but why do they have the weak moments? Because they've already allowed themselves to get alone in a situation with a woman that they shouldn't be getting alone with at all. We need to make sure that we abstain from all appearance of evil and, and not make provision for our flesh. So those are the 12 things that, that every Christian ought to be doing. Keep these in mind. I'll, I'll run through them real briefly as we, as we close here. Warn them that are unruly. Give them a fair warning. Let them know that God will hold them responsible for their actions. Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. Very important things. We need to not look on them as disdain and be patient with them. Be patient toward all men. Number five, see that none render evil for evil unto any man. Don't take vengeance on people. Let God do that. Number six, rejoice evermore. God wants you to be happy. Rejoice. Be happy with the things that you have. Be content with the things that you have and rejoice by, uh, by keeping God's commandments and being right with Him. Pray, number seven, pray without ceasing. Go to God in prayer. Make sure you're doing this, that, that you're going to Him and, uh, and asking Him for the things that you need. Verse eight, in everything give thanks. Be thankful for what you have. Don't have a spoiled bread attitude. Number nine, quench not the spirit. When God's trying to get a hold of you and tell you what you're doing is not right, don't quench that spirit. Or not only that, when God's trying to tell you maybe hey, go, go give this person the gospel. I know I've felt that before. You see someone like, wow, this is a perfect opportunity to give them the gospel. And maybe you're alone with someone. You're like, oh man, I should give them the gospel. And then fear takes over and then you just don't do it. Hey, don't quench that spirit. God's telling you to do that for a reason. That could cost that person their salvation by you not opening up your mouth and boldly giving them the gospel. Just because you were a little bit afraid because you didn't know what they would say or whatever your fears may be. Don't quench that spirit. It's important that God's trying to tell you something for a reason. Number 10, despise not prophesying. Don't get angry at the preaching. If it's God's word, if it's what's true from the Bible, don't get angry at it. Number 11, prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Don't just believe everything you hear. Test it out. Read it in the Bible. See for yourself. Make sure it lines up. But whatever, whatever is right that's proven, hold on to that. That's the truth. That's good. And then number 12, abstain from all appearance of evil. 
Don't even give people the opportunity to make up rumors and to think things about you because you're doing things that would appear to be evil. No one's going to see me walking into a bar, you know, in, in the middle of the night and just, you know, like, what's he doing? Like, I'm not going to go use a restroom in a bar. That's me. That's one of the things that I'm not going to do. I'm not going to do it because it's, it's an appearance of evil. Someone sees, oh, wow, I just saw Baz of Burzins. Well, you know, it's 10 o'clock at night and he's walking in about that bar over there. What's he doing? It's appearance of evil. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words and for all these, these 12 things that we ought to keep in mind, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us. And, um, you know, I'm sure some of us are, are doing great with, with many of these aspects, dear Lord, but I'm sure we're all also struggling with others, dear Lord. Help us to identify the ones that we definitely need to work on more and that we could incorporate in our life better, dear Lord, that we can do these things that, um, that are pleasing in your sight, dear Lord, and that will ultimately bring us joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.